Greetings and welcome to our final session on the, uh, the teaching that we've been putting forth concerning the deep work that's done before revival. And we want to come to the last two uh, sections that we mentioned will be part of this series. And uh, let me just begin with a little uh, recap, a little preliminary work here to help lay the foundation uh, in case this message happens to be listened to uh, as a standalone message. Um, as I've mentioned several times, there's a deep passion in my heart, a deep burden really, uh, for God's people to prepare themselves for the upcoming revival. Um, I've listened to tapes and uh, many series uh, in the past from preachers who have preached during times of revival. And uh, the product of that is it created a burden within me uh, and a realization that in some instances people misunderstand uh, and misinterpret what God is doing uh, in his revival. And through that, God began to deal with me about the preparation work that's done before revival by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God, in the hearts of his people, so that the potency, if I could say that, of the revival is experienced to its fullness. Um, revivals of the past, uh, some of them have had a deep impact and some of them have been somewhat superficial. And I feel as though God has spoken to me and said that the focus really should be on the time prior to revival in order to understand what the impact of revival is going to be. And we pray, and rightly so, for God to send his rain, to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. But do we take into consideration that unless preparatory work is done in our hearts, we may not enter into the fullness of the revival? Now, there are illustrations that we've been looking at, and some of them have been straightforward, such as Josiah. And some of them have been, shall we say, somewhat abstract, uh, such as the digging of the ditches and the filling of the cruises of oil. But somehow the Spirit of God has cohesed these together, brought them together, and is conveying to us a message of what God does uh, before he pours forth his Spirit or before he visits the earth. And we have the example of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came on the scene, and John the Baptist uh, precluded Christ. He came before Christ with a message of repentance to get people ready for Christ. He must increase, I must decrease, is what John said. But John came with the message of repentance, baptism, and that was a preparatory work so that the Lord could come and, uh, and, and pre prepare the, the nation of Israel in particular for the coming of the Lord. All of these things that we've been looking at uh, have one thing in common. Even John the Baptist, to a certain extent, fulfills this this mandate. All of these things have something in common. They remove what is there to make ready for what is to come. And I have said on several occasions throughout the series, you know, we don't want to be simplistic. We don't want to be uh, uh, gullible and, and, and simplistic in our thinking. We want to understand that when God comes and pours out his spirit, it is not a serendipitous event. It is uh, meeting a particular criteria on his timetable, on his the God's calendar. And uh, the desire in the heart of God is that when he does pour out his spirit, as we read in Joel chapter 2, pour out my spirit upon all flesh, verse 28 and so forth, the intent is not just to titillate mankind with all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders. No, his desire is transformation. His desire is a deeper relationship with his people, his desire is that he would produce a holy seed. Uh, so again, we don't want to be simplistic and just think that it's the ebb and flow of blessing. And, you know, there's going to be miracles and signs and wonders, which we all crave, myself included. Uh, but we, we, need to be, we need to be wise. We don't want to just see the acts of God. We want to understand his ways. And so um, there are two points that we've made uh, in these classes, two points that are... Um, kind of the impetus of what um, we've been saying here and, and what's driving the illustrations that we've been using. The first point, uh, as we have already stated before, is that mankind does not have an infinite capacity. And just as a vessel, 
Uh, if it's half filled with something else, then you only have half capacity in that vessel. If it's filled with something else, then it can't be filled, you know, uh, in this case with the, the water of the spirit or the oil of the spirit because it's filled with other things. If it's filled with earth, halfway full with earth, then there's only half capacity there. We don't have infinite capacity. We can't be filled with other things, especially things of this world, idols, uh, carnality, uh, earthy things, and expect to be able to receive the full impact of what God is pouring out. So the work that God does before revival is to empty the vessel. And we experience it. We feel it. Uh, I have to confess to you, it's not always a pleasant experience. It can be a very uh, trying experience. Uh, many may not survive it at all and, and decide to leave because uh, who wants to be emptied? Empty is not a good thing. Empty is empty. And yet somehow this emptying needs to take place before God's spirit is poured out. Um, I heard a, a minister say this one time, you know, that God gives a promise and then he tries people on that promise as he did Joseph. Uh, concerning the promise that was given to Joseph. The word of the Lord tried him, as the Psalms tell us. And then, you know, there are people who feel as though they can't endure it, and they leave, and they leave, and they leave. And then finally, we find that the church is empty. And then it is upon that remnant, that faithful remnant, that has held the charge, that has kept the faith, that God begins to bring the increase. And, and we see this in the digging of the ditches. We see this in the cleansing of the land by Josiah. We see this in the cruise of oil. Bring me vessels, empty vessels, and bring not a few. And so we don't have infant capacity. Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. This is uh, illustrating that we do not have infinite capacity. Uh, we either have a love for one or we have a love for the other. And so we want to guard our hearts very carefully. Now, the second point uh, that we have been bringing out is this, is that God does not want mixture. God is not interested in a bride who's half filled with the world and the carnality of the world and then half filled with the spirit of God and spirituality. And so this is why, another reason why God must bring an emptying in our lives and in the church prior to his move. He doesn't want what he pours into us to be mixed with the world. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these things have to be removed from us prior to the outpouring of his Holy Spirit so that we can receive the full impact of what he's doing. Again, please, let's not be, let's not, let us not be simple concerning these things. Let us be wise and understanding and understand these things so that we can be uh, prepared. Um, it needs to be pointed out. It needs to be emphasized, although it's it kind of goes without saying that we don't do the work. It's the Spirit of God that does the work. And yet, and yet, we must allow it. Uh, I'm not saying to anyone, you know, uh, in these lessons, uh, you must go out and you must do this. No, what I'm saying more is this, that God is the one that does the emptying. Now, in the case of the shovels, right, in the case of the ditches, they had to dig. And so there is a certain part, a certain aspect that man plays in it, but God is the one who brings the water. And so uh, we want to um, remember these two points. We don't have an infinite capacity. We can't take in the things of this world, uh, embrace and love the things of this world, and embrace spiritual things as well. God will bring us to a point of decision, especially prior to revival, because again, it's a matter of capacity. And then God uh, does not want mixture in our lives. So uh, we are at the end of the session, meaning this, this, is the, this is the last of the three-part series. But let me just again go through the points that we covered, or the sections. We had the first session, we had the introduction in part one, uh, digging ditches, increasing capacity that way. Uh, the second session, we had part two, destroying the idols during the time of Josiah prior to the finding of the book of the law and the revival of the law. Um, and we might say that this was a cleansing in the land. And part three also was uh, covered in class two, and that is gathered vessels, gathered vessels, and they must be empty 
vessels in order to be filled. Only the empty vessels were the ones that were filled. And then tonight um, we're covering the last part, the last two parts of this, uh, part five, excuse me, part four and part five, the wise virgins. We'll look at the wise virgins and we'll understand that the wise virgins had a greater capacity to be filled than the foolish virgins because the foolish virgins ran out of oil. They ran out of oil. And then we'll bring it to a conclusion with Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. It's time to seek the Lord and to break up the fallow ground. And so we've asked this question throughout the series. Why does God dig so deep before revival? Why do we have to be so empty before he moves? And the one common theme in everything we've covered so far has been this word empty. Empty, 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 empty. And this is the thing that I want to get into our spirits. Do you feel empty today? Do you feel as though the fire of God has come to you and there's practically nothing left? Do you feel as though, you know, uh, the, the vessel has very little oil left in it, very little water left in it, and maybe perhaps like the widow, uh, you know, we're going to prepare a meal, my sons and I, and then we're going to die. Uh, but that was when the miracle came. That was when, you know, things changed. And so why does God dig so deep? It's as we've stated already, God wants the impact of his move to be complete. And in the last days, folks, in these last days, this is going to be the outpouring that prepares the church to meet Jesus Christ in the air. This is going to be the outpouring that is going to produce a bride that's without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing. This has to be impactful. This revival has to hit its mark. Unlike many of the revivals that we look at in the past, uh, you know, they, they did a work for sure. And the people, uh, there are always people that come out of every revival that are the, the fire blazers, the trail blazers, and are those that let the revival uh, reach its fullest impact in their lives. Even during the time of Josiah, we mentioned that uh, after Josiah's death, you know, that God judged the people and Babylon came. But let's not forget, out of that revival, uh, we have Daniel, we have Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, we have Ezekiel the prophet. And so there are always people who, for whom the revival uh, reaches its full extent. We want to be those people. We want to be those people. So let's not be weary because we feel empty. That's, that's par. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to go. And so, you know, you feel empty today? I feel empty today. I feel like, hmm. I received a prophecy many years ago. And the prophecy was, you know, that God was going to deal in my life and that God was going to dig in my life. And that at the time that he came to meet with me, I would feel as though there was nothing left. And oh, I can testify that I'm very close to that right now. But, uh, but I have hope and I have faith and I have confidence uh, that God is going to move and God is going to pour out his spirit. But I want to receive the full impact of it. I don't want to leave nothing behind. I want to be you know, uh, the one that's going to rise and, uh, rise and meet him in the air that's going to be without spot or wrinkle. I mean, all I see today in my life are spots and wrinkles. But God is digging deep, and God is putting his finger on things and emptying the vessel. And so uh, one of the things that I want to also point out is um, who is it that God is going to fall upon? Who are the ones that God will fall upon? But well, we know that there were over 500 that received the promise to go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. There were over 500 brethren that got that call, but there were only 120 who showed uh, who were there when the Spirit fell out. And so what is the qualifying factor for those who were there? In Acts chapter 2, let me read verses uh, 1 and 2. And when, they, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So there's two uh, statements in these verses that I want to draw our attention to. The first is, they were all in one accord. They all were in one accord. How essential it is for the church to be in one accord. How essential it is for everybody to be pulling on the same rope, for everybody to be striving for the same goal, for the same vision, and for everybody to, you know, be accepting the working and the dealing that God 
is is doing. So they all were one accord. They all were in one accord. And then the house was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that. The point that I want to make concerning that is this. There's really only one way uh, that the church can come into unity, and that is when they are emptied of themselves. The problem with the world today, one of the problems with the world, there are probably a whole list of things, but one of the problems with the world today is that everybody's fighting for their own. Everybody's striving for their own. They're suing, they're fighting, there's contention, so that some, so that one might gain the advantage over the other. And that's not going to produce unity. What produces unity is when we're emptied of ourselves, when we're emptied of ourselves. And so they uh, were in this place, and they all were in one accord, and then the house was filled. You see the illustration there? You see the connection there? Unity and then the filling. Unity and the filling. And so uh, we can refer to Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2. For some of us, this is one of the favorite psalms. Um, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment. Do you see the connection here between unity and the oil? They all were with, in one accord on the, in the book of Acts, in the day of Pentecost. They all were in one accord, and then the house was filled with the oil. In Psalm 133, when the brethren are dwelling together in unity, then there's the precious ointment, and there's the precious oil. The ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. You know, in the church many things come up, and sometimes, you know, even in the church, people begin to fight for their rights and begin to try and, you know, push their own causes. But I've learned over the years that, you know, maybe maybe sometimes you take the hit for the team, so to speak. Maybe sometimes, you know, you allow your rights to be infringed upon. Sometimes you allow, you know, yourself to be wronged uh, just to resolve the contention that exists. And there might be the feeling within your heart, well, you know, I didn't get satisfaction. Uh, I had to, to take the hit. But the reality is this. You know, God looks upon that and God sees that and says, this person is interested in unity. Now, and I'm, I'm certainly not talking about unity at any cost. We're not talking about uh, turning other cheek when, you know, blatant sin is involved and so forth. We're talking about the, the little injustices of life where you don't get your way. Uh, somehow God looks upon uh, our hearts and says, you know, this one really cares for unity. This one really wants uh, the fellowship in the church to be united. I have seen those that are contentious rise up in the church, and I have seen them swept out. There's no premium on that. And so on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord. There's unity in Psalm 133, and unity always, always is associated with oil. And so the Holy Ghost was poured out. Let's be emptied of ourselves. This is the point. Let's be empty of ourselves. This is the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our day. Uh, I, in my life, I mean, you know, you don't keep count, you don't keep score, but many, many times, many, many times in my life, you know, I have experiences in the justices of life. And sometimes, you know, you get riled until you get your head on straight and you say, mm, this is not worth fighting for. I'm going to let this one go. Maybe you come back and you, you know, you, you come back with a different attitude and say, no, I'm seeking love. I'm seeking unity. I'm not going to make an issue out of this. Well, those are the people who are there when the Holy Ghost is poured out. Those are the people, you know, who are in one accord when the Holy Ghost is poured out. So spoken plainly, we simply say this, that unity comes from emptiness emptied of ourselves, emptied of our rights, empty of our, you know, dear desire and self-will, emptied of those things. And then, you know, upon those uh, comes the Holy Ghost. You know, the interesting thing about this, the qualifier is emptiness. And what I mean by that is the commonality is that all of those who are there on the day of Pentecost, you know, they're empty. All, you know, of the vessels that are gathered are filled with oil. Uh, all the ditches that have been dug are filled with water. And so it really is the secret to unity is emptiness. And we want to be in unity. We don't want to be, 
you know, there, there to be factions and disagreements among us and contentions among us. You know, that's not glorifying to God. I have seen over the years uh, people that have stood up for their rights. Uh, some of them uh, have stood up for their rights because they perceived of an injustice. You know, they make a big fuss about it. And, uh, you know, uh, then they get offended and they leave. And immediately after they leave, we see the issue resolved. And you begin to understand that God was testing them and God was trying them. And, and unfortunately, they failed the test. So the secret to unity is emptiness, and unity is the secret to the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to Psalm 133 and the oil that flowed down the beard of Aaron. Now, we'll come to section uh, part four, section four. And now we're talking about the wise virgins. And as we have said throughout the series, there's not enough time to uh, fully extract all of the truths that are associated with these stories that we read. We're simply trying to read these stories and bring out one salient point and, and make a, a linear, linear, linear focus uh, and try to help us understand, you know, what God, uh, one of the messages that God is conveying through these illustrations. And so we come now to chapter 25 of Matthew and the story of the five wives and the five foolish virgins. And I want to, uh, again, as we said at the very beginning, the very start here, I want to state this. It is a question of capacity with these ten virgins. It is, as we have been saying, it is a question of capacity. And I want us to understand something. I want to lay the groundwork for something right up the bat. The context of Matthew chapter 25 is the last days. Now, now, we know that when they wrote the scriptures, there were no chapter divisions. Matthew chapter 24 is the little apocalypse where Jesus is talking about the events of the last days. And he follows that, uh, that dissertation on what's going to take place in the last days with the story of the ten virgins. And so the context of the ten virgins, we must understand, is the last days. Now... We're going to go through this, but I want to point something out and put it in your mind before we, we even start going down this road. This is the last days. What do we understand concerning the last days? We understand that the greatest revival that the world has ever known takes place in the last days. How is it possible that there are five foolish virgins who do not have enough oil, even though they experience revival? This is the point that we're making here. This is the point. It's a question of capacity. The five wise virgins had enough oil for their lamps so that they could go into the marriage supper. The five foolish virgins did not have enough oil. So we don't know this from the scripture, and so this is Frank's postulation, okay? This is my uh, supposition. It is not necessarily founded in the scriptures, but I think it's sound. It is, to me... It seems likely that those virgins had other things in those lamps. Therefore, there was not the capacity to hold all the oil that they needed. And this is the point that we're making. The ten virgins, the five wise, I view them as perhaps being those whose vessels were empty and were filled with the oil. And the five foolish, perhaps the capacity in their lamps were taken up with other things. And therefore, they did not have enough. Now, now listen, the impact is this. The five foolish virgins who are Christians, who are in the church, who experience revival, are forbidden for going into the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're forbidden because they lack the oil. How important is this message? It's that important. The qualifier for going into the marriage supper of the Lamb is the capacity to hold the Spirit of God you know, when the revival is poured out. And of course, you understand when I say hold, I don't mean that we have control over the Holy Spirit. I simply mean the capacity. We have the capacity to hold what it is that God wants to do in our lives. They were granted entrance, the five wise, because they had enough oil. The five foolish were denied entrance because they did not. It is a question of capacity. And we do not have infinite capacity. Listen, if we're in a church 
and we're filled with worldliness. We listen to worldly music, or, or maybe you know even the the church uh, ministry, but the worship is worldly, and we're filled with other things other than just the Spirit of Christ. It's taking up capacity in our hearts. And these are days when we need to prostrate ourselves before the Lord and say, Oh God, I must be empty when the revival comes. I must be free from idolatry. I must be free from carnality. I must be free from those things which are earthy and of this world so that I might receive the fullness of what's going to happen. Now, I say this and I feel a, a real... Uh, kind of a pain in my heart as I say this. There are going to be many who are listening to this very message who are not going to uh, 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 are not going to deal with things that are in their heart, and they're going to miss the fullness of what God's doing. I'm not saying they're going to be lost. I'm not saying that you know they're not going to go to heaven. But what I am saying is, if you don't have enough oil in your lamp, you're not going to the marriage supper. Not everybody who's born again is going to make it to the marriage supper. Matthew 25 lays that flat on the line. These were all Christians. There were 10 virgins. They're all Christians. Five went into the marriage and five were denied because of a question of capacity. Well, this is a big deal. It's a very big deal. Now, let me read the text. I just want to lay that, want to lay that foundation and put that uh, in your spirit as we go through this. Matthew chapter 25 uh, verses 1 to 8. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Vessels. We have this word vessel again, don't we? While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all of those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, of your lamps. Uh, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And so the, set, the setting is this here. They have their lamps, uh, and they have uh, what we call a secondary vessel, and that secondary vessel would have been uh, holding oil. And the Wives, virgins, they had plenty of oil for their lamps. And yet the foolish virgins, you know, they did not have oil for their lamps. And my postulation is this. You know, their, their vessels were filled with other things. And the, the, this, is, this is kind of common with the example of uh, the, the prophet's wife, who uh, Elisha came in and filled her vessels with oil. It's a question of capacity. So the foolish virgins, you know, because of foolishness, they are foolish virgins, uh, they did not prepare. And, you know, the capacity was not sufficient in order to uh, have their lamps trimmed so that they could go to the marriage supper. And so capacity, the five wise still had oil. The five foolish had run out because they did not have enough. They did not have enough. So why didn't they have enough? We, we've said this already. We laid this foundation. Why didn't they have enough? The greatest revival the world has ever known takes place before the marriage, just before the marriage supper of the Lamb, actually. And yet they went through full-scale revival and yet still didn't have enough oil in their lamps. That, that should cause us to ponder just a wee bit and say, how is that possible? How is it possible they didn't have enough? You know, when we looked, we didn't look at this in, in detail, and, and we're not going to go back and revisit it, but in the example of Josiah's revival, you know, the revival was the revival of the law, of the law, rather. And so, during that time, uh, there were uh, several key players, and uh, we have Hilkiah, uh, the priest, we have Shaphan, the scribe, we have uh, Josiah, the king. And so, during this time, uh, when the book of the law was found, you know, there were different people in each of these men's houses, and uh, Shaphan in particular, and he's the one I want to focus in on. And during the time of Josiah, in fact, during the time of Jeremiah the prophet, we find that one of Shaphan's sons 
became friends of the prophet and was actually directly responsible for preserving the life of Jeremiah. But then we find in the book of Ezekiel, the other son of Shaphan, uh, uh, the names escape me right now, but uh, they can be easily looked up. But the uh, um, Jazaniah, I believe it was actually, uh, when Ezekiel was brought back to the temple <clears throat> in the spirit, and he dug a hole in the wall, and he said, uh, the Lord showed to um, Ezekiel the idolatry that the elders of Israel had um, in their hearts, and God revealed to Ezekiel the creeping things, the idolatrous things that were in the hearts of his people, and the Lord was saying to Ezekiel, why should I be entreated of them? Among one of those elders is Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan, and yet, you know, God is saying, look at the idols in this man's heart. This man experienced full-scale revival. This man was uh, a part of the household of Shaphan when the book of the law was found and the king rent his garments, and yet it's being so close to the revival, it had no impact on him. And yet his other brother uh, became touched, became moved, and became friends with Jeremiah the prophet. And so uh, I preached a message many years ago about these two men. And uh, the point is that some go through the revival and are wonderfully changed, and others go through the revival and are not changed at all. After the full-scale revival, this man still had idols within his heart. And so coming back to the five wise and the five foolish um, I speculate that the five foolish, uh, that their hearts were filled with other things, and so they did not have a capacity for what God was doing. And you know, I think Phil safe in predicting this, that the same thing will occur in our days. And I preach this message because I want to, um, I want to make an impact. I want some people to understand uh, I want them to hear the message, and I want them to be wise as it relates to revival and wise as to what God is going to do before he does it so that we can prepare. The Holy Spirit is already going through the church, is already dealing with the hearts of men. He's already dealing, you know, in the churches. We see uh, many departures in the churches because people are getting offended. But we need to hold fast and we need to hold on and let God do his work in us so that when revival comes, you know, those who remain are going to be those vessels. Uh, when the cruise of oil was filling the vessels during the time uh, of, of the woman uh, you know, whose vessels were filled, uh, she turns to her sons and she said, bring me another vessel. And they said, there's not another vessel to be had. And so it's a finite number. I want to um, re 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 rehearse something that I said earlier. Um, in the series. And as I mentioned, uh, I, I've listened to many sermons from revivals past, and I've listened to many of the leaders of conferences that were in full-scale revival. And I want to share with you an exhortation that Dr. Brian J. Bailey gave uh, in the middle of a full-scale revival back in the late 60s and early 70s. In actuality, uh, he was warning the group in front of him uh, that was already in full-scale revival. He was giving a little warning, a little, maybe a little even chastisement for those that were in the revival. And this is what he was saying to them. He said, do not miss what God is really doing because of the blessings that revivals bring. He was talking about signs and wonders and miracles and healing. Again, all very essential things. Don't miss what God is really doing because of the blessings revival brings. Let the power of the Holy Spirit get deep into your spirit and bring the transformation it is intended to bring. In fact, at one point he said, don't get carried away with splashing in the puddles of revival. Let the full impact of the revival hit you. The full impact of the revival that's coming, yes, it's going to be a harvest rain. Yes, there's going to be miracles, and thank God for it. But really, the, the real intent of the revival that's coming in the last days, uh, we can understand from the rains that are in Israel. We have the former rain and the latter rain. The former rain is the planter rain. The latter rain is the maturing rain. And so what is God doing in the revival of our day that's coming in our day? It's to bring the church to that spotless perfection that he desires when we meet him in the air without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. This is the purpose. 
It's not going to be about the blessings. And oh, yes, we know there'll be blessings. Oh, yes, we know. But through those blessings, uh, some will be lifted up in pride. Some will raise up ministries to themselves. Some will take the glory, you know, this, that, and the other. This would be typical of any revival that in modern time that we've ever seen. But we want this rain that is to come to be a maturing rain, that it gets deep into our spirits, that we spend much time in his presence, that we, you know, let God do everything in us that he wants to do. Don't let the revival come and only have a superficial impact. This is the one thing that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to me perpetually throughout this entire uh, series. As I'm in my study and preparing my notes, he's saying, don't let the revival be superficial. Don't let the revival be superficial. Don't let the revival be superficial. Let it reach its full impact in our lives. And so we know that there's going to be full-scale revival in the last days. We know that it's going to be the harvester rain to bring the crop, meaning us, to maturity. And so we want to make sure, you know, that we are prepared by it. I'm, I'm smitten even tonight as I, you know, speak this message. I'm smitten tonight. How is it possible that during full-scale revival, there could be five virgins that had no oil in their vessels to trim their lamps? Well, I want to segue into the last section here. So let me wrap this part up, I want to get into part five, so let me wrap, wrap up verse four. It's the time before revival that we're in right now. And the point of these messages is, you know, what is our attitude towards the time before revival? Well, all of the illustrations that we used in each of these sections is to bias our mind in a certain direction, that we are not just going to haphazardly, serendipitously, stumble into revival and trust, you know, come what may, that the revival will have its impact. We're going to be wise concerning the work that the Holy Spirit does prior to revival. We're going to be wise about the counsel to dig ditches, to remove the earth, remove that which is carnal, remove that which is earthy. We're going to be wise concerning, you know, uh, the time of Josiah and, and the, the removing of the idol, uh, idols, the bringing down of the groves, you know, the dispossessing of all of the idolatrous practices in the land. The restoration of the temple that took place during the revival of, of Josiah. All of this was done so that God could magnify his law uh, and to uh, uh, write his law in the hearts of his people. And then we have the cruise of oil, the example of the cruises of oil, uh, the cruise of oil and the vessels, I should say. And uh, the only qualification for those vessels being filled was that they first were emptied. And so... The, the mandate, the command was given, bring empty vessels and bring not a few. And so when the mother, when the wife of the prophet who died said, my sons, bring me another vessel. They said, there's not another vessel. What they actually were saying was, there are no more empty vessels. That's the qualifier uh, of being emptied. So that's not a pleasant experience to be emptied. I, I realize that. I understand that. But if we are wise and if we are understanding you know we'll let that work be done in our lives so that when the revival comes we'll know that we have the capacity that we need uh, this revival that's coming is intended to usher us right up to the second coming to bring a revival into our lives you know whereby the oil will be sustained right up to the second coming and the ushering into the marriage supper of the lamb that is the message that is what we, what we get through uh, Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And so there is a contrast between those that have been emptied versus those, you know, who uh, have other things in there and therefore their relationship with the revival is superficial. So now I want to bring this to a close. This last section is very, is very short. It only has one verse really in it, but in the last section here, in the conclusion, I want to leave us with this small exhortation. In Hosea chapter 12, excuse me, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, we read these familiar verses. 
Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. It's time to seek the Lord, folks. It's time for us to carve out places of devotion. It's time for us to carve out uh, places where we sit and we read his word and we, we study his word and we make our notes. It's time for us to cry out, O God, uh, empty me from those things which are distractions. It's time to cry out, you know, Lord, uh, I want to be empty so that I can be filled. You know, we have many things that fill our times right now. And in a dry time, that's always the way it is. There's no, uh, it's not a critical or con condemning statement. We have many things that draw our attention, many things that uh, turn us to the left and to the right, many entertainments, many uh, activities and so forth. And, and some of those activities are helpful and good. We, we acknowledge that. But you know, when revival comes, there's not going to be time for any of that stuff. It's not going to be time for any of that. It is going to be a time of, of letting us be filled with, with God. It's going to be the time for praying for people, leading them to Christ, helping them, you know, in their relationship with Christ, and also to get them filled. And so uh, it's going to be an exciting time, but there's not going to be the time for uh, all of the things that uh, fill our, our space now. Uh, and we want to be careful about the type of things that we do participate in because, you know, they could steal away the devotion and the capacity that we have, you know, to serve and love the Lord. The, the world's impact on the heart of a believer is to make them lukewarm, superficial, and cold. And so we want to begin to draw ourselves away from those things which we feel may have a negative impact on our heart and as you draw yourself away from those things, and as you fill yourself with God's word, the natural inclination will be to seek the Lord, because that's what the word of God does within us. It produces uh, a thirst for more. For many, many years, my daughters have encouraged me to drink more water. And uh, my reply to them was, I drink more water than anyone I know. It just happens to be in a cup of coffee which my cardiologist told me is not really the way it works. But <laughs> anyways, we'll move on. But I didn't want to drink the water because I didn't like the taste. And then, you know, one day I felt inspired to just begin to increase my intake of water. And the amazing thing that happened was this. I began to crave water. I began to crave more. Water began to taste good to me. It began to become more refreshing to me. And I began to drink more water. See, the thing is this. If we fill ourselves with the world, if we fill ourselves with carnal things, then that's what our appetite will be uh, biased towards. But if we fill ourselves with prayer, with seeking God, with reading the Word of God, spending time with Him, then we'll be looking for opportunities. Uh, I can remember many times in my life when you know I would go throughout my day and all I could think about was the next morning when I would be able to get up and spend time with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and seek God's presence and seek His Word because uh, my appetite was whetted for that. And so that's, that's the way that we want to be. So this last section here really is all about, you know, seeking the Lord. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. You know, fallow ground is ground, like in Matthew chapter 13, where it talks about the wayside. It says concerning the wayside that it was compacted soil, you know, soil that was beaten down from use, and what happened? Well, the seeds landed on the surface, but because it couldn't penetrate the earth, uh, the fowls of the air came and uh, took away the seed. And this is what the enemy wants to do in our lives. But if we seek the Lord, if we carve out time for the Lord, if we spend time in his word, reading his word, letting him speak precious promises to us, telling us, you know, what the and what his plan for our life is. It's like, it's like furrows of a plow turning the soil, breaking up the fallow ground. And then God can give us a vision for what he has for our life. He can give us a vision for what he wants to do in the church in our day. And he can begin to speak precious promises to us that we believe. And God will begin to empty our lives of other things so that we can have a full capacity uh, for him in the revival that's coming. I really hope this series has been a blessing to you. I hope that in uh, 
the going through this this information, uh, you found something that God has quickened to you, and uh, we just commit that to you and ask you know that you prayerfully consider uh, the points of this series. God bless you.